<laughs> Just Italians. Ah, Mario Puzo, the Sicilian Napolitan, the godfather of crime fiction, a writer of such renown that he hated his own books. Yeah, did you know Puzo actually hated the Godfather novel? He said it was the worst thing he'd ever written, hands down. He wrote it just for the money it would bring. Kind of like a real gangster. Well, he said he liked the book, that it was about guys he would have liked to hang out with back in the day. Of course, he never really knew any gangsters, or not really. The one thing he did know was his own life. The Fortunate Pilgrim was Puzo's second novel after The Dark Arena. It follows Lucia Santa, who's moved from Naples... We call it Napoli! ...and established a life for herself in America. Of course, that life is plagued by poverty, tragedy, and death, but it's still better than the oblivion that awaited her in Italy. Lucia Santa, Angoluzzi Corbo, has six children by two different men, one of whom is in the grave, the other never staying at home. The novel is very episodic, not really following a linear plot, though it does follow the children as they grow in age. It starts out in the 20s, and even though they're poor, they're still living the good life, away from the oppressive tyranny of old Italy and embracing the new opportunity of America. The daughter is just coming of age and is developing two very big problems. <coughs> <coughs> The oldest son is going out and making money and a name for himself as a grown man, and all the little kids are stuck in school. School sucks. Of course, as bad as things are, they're nothing compared to the horrors that are wrought by the coming depression, when money is scarce and food is uncertain. They can't even get real olive oil! They live like animals! The eldest son even joins up with the Mafia, becoming a man of honor, as it were. That is so whack. <laughs> right there! See? That's what I'm talking about. We're Italian, Robert. Okay? Whack means something else to us. But, even the sadness of the Depression is lifted by the triumphant calls of war. Funny to think, the only thing that could alleviate the Depression is the tyranny of the Nazi regime. The novel does end on a note of hope, with them escaping the tenements of Manhattan and setting up shop on Long Island. Part of the novel focuses on little Gino, who's supposed to be Mario Puzo's stand-in for himself. He's a weird little kid, often running off and playing in the park or sitting around and reading books. You think he might be portrayed as a precocious and innocent youngster, but he's a little brat! He gets in fights with his mother, doesn't go to school, and bums around doing nothing all day. And of course, to me, that's the hallmark of a real hero, but the story chastises him for it and makes him out to be the shame of the whole family. The biggest problem is, I see so much of myself in the little tyke. It got to be a little too close to home, if you know what I mean. Yeah, this is Italy. Look, the town drunk is two years old. Hey, Mambo! Mambo Italiano! Uh. Originally, he was to be the main focus of the story, but Puzo claims he realized just how much of a brat he was and how much of a hero his mother was. He claimed that he based Don Corleone on his mother and that... Whenever the Godfather opened his mouth, I heard the voice of my mother, her courage, her wisdom, her ruthlessness, and her unconquerable love for her family. Now, I may not have had an Italian grandma, but that sounds about like my grandmother, and her complete devotion to her family and her carrying on our heritage. Of course, she made spaghetti as good as any of those guineas, so maybe she was one, I don't know. Ooh, you suck! Oh, what? I can't say guinea now? I was just talking about the pigs. Anyway, the book, much to Puzo's surprise and chagrin, was not an instant bestseller and didn't put his name in the history books. He didn't know what happened. The book did get good reviews, though, from the pretentious literary circles. He reasoned out the only way to make money was to completely sell out and write a story about the stereotype of Italians as criminals, filled to the brim with blood, thunder, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And gambling. I did a whole video on his first bestseller. Check it out if you really want to know more. But you already know the story, right? Well, Puzo says he always hated that book and that it was his greatest shame as a writer, selling out his art just for the money. Of course, this kind of falls apart given that he returned to these themes again and again. Yeah, The Fortunate Pilgrim has a small mafia subplot, but it's really just there to emphasize how distant the son is becoming from his mom. Italian mom without bad kids? Hey, 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 what the hell is all the commotion in here? We're not doing anything. You getting fresh with me? I'm tired of bailing both of you out of prison. We're both in co- Between you and me, 
and whoever else watches this video, I still like The Godfather better. Maybe it's because I grew up with The Godfather and it really defined a lot of my worldview. Yeah, a freaking gangster movie inspired me. Hell, I've been trying to learn the Italian language, predominantly, because of it. Never mind that they're speaking Sicilian in the film. Yeah, there's a difference. It's complicated. But do I like The Godfather because I'm one of the brainwashed masses? Or do I like it because it's just a better story? This is an old story. If a writer makes his book too smart, it won't have mainstream appeal and the average Joe on the street won't like it. But if he makes it too dumb, the average Joe on the street will be insulted and still won't like it. So, theoretically, if you make it too smart, there are people who will read it and say they like it solely because it's different. But does that mean it's good? Well, I do happen to like long, descriptive passages of blood, guts, violence, human disfigurement, sex, the female body, various doings with the female body, and any combination of the aforementioned. However, most people regard me as a sick fuck who just likes stuff that's gross. Okay, I could buy that. But I cite the huge popularity of the Godfather horror movies and the evening news as evidence I'm not alone in this regard. La comedia è finita. <laughs> And like I said, Puzzo came back to the Mafia again and again. I actually read his novel Fools Die about gamblers in Las Vegas because he also said it was his best work. It wasn't too bad, but I think he said that more for publicity's sake than anything else. Of course, it featured a trip to Japan, so I can't hate it too much. It didn't have Yakuza, though. Nevertheless, it did feature gangsters pretty predominantly in its story. There was The Sicilian, about the real-life Sicilian bandit Salvatore Giuliano. It was supposed to be during Michael Corleone's exile in Sicily during the film, and even the great godfather himself appears towards the end of the novel. It was turned into a film starring Christopher Lambert. I have never seen it. Puzzo also wrote The Last Don a kind of modern-day version of The Godfather. It was turned into a TV movie starring Danny Aiello, which was amazing. Or, at the very least, I liked it. It almost inspired me to read the book. Almost. He lastly wrote Omerta, the Sicilian Code of Silence. Johnny Tightlips, where'd they hit you? I ain't saying nothing. Well, what do I tell the doctor? Tell him to suck a lemon. Lastly, lastly, his girlfriend managed to finish his final novel, The Family, about the papal dynasty of the Borgias in Rome, which he defined as the original crime family, which is really where The Godfather gets its strength. It's a classic historical novel covering the epic lives of kings and queens, oaths of felty, and decrees of vengeance, just put into an outlaw context. He took a classic story and made it new. It's interesting that I first read The Godfather right after I read Frank Herbert's Dune, which took the same idea but put it in a science fiction context. Obviously, both of these books have heavily influenced my thinking. There's also a film of The Fortunate Pilgrim, a miniseries actually. Sophia Loren played the lead role. Yes, that's Sophia Loren. The problem is, of course, that Sophia Loren is a stunningly beautiful woman, even into her elder years, which simply doesn't fit the portrait of the woman in the novel. She's supposed to be one of those huge, burly Italian ladies from the old country, a body shaped by years of hardship and worshipping food as though it's the most precious thing in the world. Which it is. But I didn't actually see the movie, though judging from its reception, it wasn't all that in a bowl of pasta bazoule. Mamma mia! La crudele polpetta della guerra ci è arrivata in grembo rovinando le nostre braghe bianche della pace! But getting back to the novel, while it might not have been as epic or grandiose as The Godfather, certainly its depiction of real life would have given readers something to latch onto, right? I mean, it tells the story of how most of us got here, about immigrants and heritage of the new world and the old. So why didn't it succeed? Well, it goes back to the idea of, if I wanted to live real life, I'd just put the book down and live it. Even going back to ancient times, there's a Roman novel, in Latin prose and everything, called the Satyricon. While the book is about a lot of things, it focuses on the love triangle between two grown men and a teenage boy they're fighting and killing each other over for. It's filled to the brim with long, lusty passages of explicit sex and huge orgies, often involving mostly men. Y yeah, I actually read this, don't judge me. Many scholars use this as an example of the prevalence of homosexuality in ancient Rome, as well as their sexual extravagance, showcasing just how wild their parties really were. While I certainly don't mean to dispute the holy words of scholars, and I didn't even read it in the original Latin, I can't help but think that it's like saying Fifty Shades of Grey is an accurate representation of American sexual tastes. People just go to read it because they don't have enough sex in their lives. Incidentally, that's the same reason I read the Satyricon. Sure, your idea might tap into something that everyone can relate to, but that's just the thing. 
A book is a fantasy, even a non-fiction one. A book is meant to transport you away to far-off worlds, to help you forget about your daily life and live as though you're someone else. There's even a theme about this in The Fortunate Pilgrim, how the kids sit around reading books about lives they couldn't live. A story may define a culture in defining what it isn't. Everybody, 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 everybody.